podcast 108, titled Women in Culture, Volume 1, ISBN 9781-63877-2989, is an intellectual conversation observed through the lens of an author, cinematographer, media art specialist, licensed cultural practitioner, and publisher. The ethos of this story is captured and framed within the ambience of culture, and specially underscoring Ralph Linton's expression. Culture, as the way of its members, the collection of ideas and habits which they learn are shared and transmitted from generation to another generation, invariably creates a platform to discourse women in culture. Linton's expression, culture, is essential to this conversation because when the theoretical construct women in culture is juxtaposed against the background of Linton's theory, the following is extracted. Throughout history, generation after generation, regardless of their decline and regrowth, all cultures change through time. No culture is static. Women have always played a critical role throughout history, from generation after generation. Culture is broad and encompasses many areas of our lives, such as the role of the family, individual, educational systems, employment, and gender. It also has guides, language use, appropriate forms of dress, and views of the world, a view espoused by Lumen Learning. Women in culture revolves around the industrial revolution, culture, and the environment. Now that I have established context, it should be noted that according to Wikipedia, since participation of women in the workforce outside of the home has increased in industrialized nations with particularly large growth seen in the 20th century. Largely seen as a boon for industrial society, women in the workforce contribute to a higher national economic output as measure in GDP, as well as decreasing labor costs by increasing the labor supply in a society. The increase of women in the labor force of Western countries gained momentum in the late 19th century. At this point, women married early on and were defined by their marriages. If they entered the workforce, it was only out of necessity. The above actions were seemingly the catalyst, which created space for four phases. Cases in point. The first phase draws our attention to the time between the late 19th century and to the 1930s. This era gave birth to the independent female worker. From 1890 to 1930, women in the workforce were typically young and unmarried. They had little or no learning on the job and typically held clerical and teaching positions. Many women also worked in textile manufacturing or as domestics. Women promptly exited the workforce when they were married unless the family needed two incomes. Women in culture created a momentum because towards the end of the 1920s, this ethos entered into the second phase. Married women began to exit the workforce less and less. Labor force productivity for married women ranged from 35 to 44 years of age, increased by 15.5 percentage points from 10% to 25%. There was a greater demand for clerical positions and as the number of women graduating high school increased, they began to hold more respectable steady jobs. It is reported that this phase has been appropriately labeled as the transition era, referring to the time period between 1930 and 1950. During this time, the discriminatory institution of marriage bars, which forced women out of the workforce after marriage, were eliminated, allowing more participation in the workforce of single and married women. Additionally, women's labor force participation increased because there was an increase 
in demand for office workers and women participated in the high school movement. However, still women's work was contingent upon their husband's income. Women did not normally work to fulfill a personal need to define one's career and social worth. They worked out of necessity. At this juncture, the time phase labeled the roots of the revolution encompassing the time from 1950, mid to late 1970s, the movement began to approach the warning signs of a revolution. Women's expectations of future employment changed. Women began to see themselves going on to college and working through their marriages and even attending graduate school. Many, however, still had brief and intermittent workforce participation without necessarily having expectations for a career. To illustrate, most women were secondary earners and work in pink-collar jobs as secretaries, teachers, nurses, and librarians. The sexual harassment experienced by these pink-collar workers is depicted in the film 9 to 5. Although more women attended college, it was often expected that they attended to find a spouse, the so-called MRS degree. Nevertheless, labor force participation by women still grew significantly, resulted in the fourth phase. Of note, the fourth phase known as the Quiet Revolution began in the late 1970s and continues on today. Beginning in the 1970s, women began to flood colleges and grad schools. They began to enter professions like medicine, law, dental, and business. More women were going to college and expected to be employed at the age of 35 as opposed to past generations that only work intermittently due to marriage and childbirth. They were able to define themselves prior to a serious relationship. Research indicates that from 1965 to 2002, the increase in women's labor force participation more than offset the decline for men. In light of the aforementioned and all things being considered, many explanations were advanced for this big jump in the 1970s has been attributed by some scholars to widespread access to the birth control pill. While the pill was medically available in the 1960s, numerous laws restricted access to it. By the 1970s, the age of majority had been lowered from 21 to 18 in the United States, largely as a consequence of the Vietnam War. This also affected women's rights to affect their own medical decisions, since it had now become socially acceptable to postpone pregnancy even while married. Women had the luxury of thinking about other things like education and work. Also, due to electrification, women's work around the house became easier leaving them with more time to be able to dedicate to school or work. Due to the multiplier effect, even if some women were not blessed with access to the pill or electrification, many followed by the example of the other women entering the workforce for those reasons. Given the logistics and specificity concerning women in culture, it is implied that there was a quiet revolution since it was not a big bang revolution. Rather, it happened and is continued to happen gradually. The more that I navigate this story, women in culture, it appears that the old adage, according to the well-known saying, necessity is the mother of invention. To put it succinctly, people, meaning women in culture, invent things because society has difficult problems that need solving. All inventions and new ideas start as tactic knowledge embedded in someone's or a group of people's head. Often, the fastest, easiest, least expensive, accurate, and sometimes the only way to access that knowledge is through direct interaction. To put things in context, analyzing the annals of history, it appears that Throughout history, a myriad of women have made invaluable contributions to the world and their cultural geographical space, despite facing gender-based discrimination. 1893, the first car heater 
was invented by Margaret A. Wilcox. She also invented a combined clothes and dish washer. Monopoly board game was invented by Elizabeth Maggie in 1904. The fire escape, this device, so vital both to public safety and the smoking habits of urban hipsters, was invented in 1887 by Anna Connolly. The life raft one day in 1882, Maria Beasley looked out at the sea and said, I quote, people should like stop dying in huge transportation disasters, end quote. And then she invented life rafts. Beasley also invented a machine for making barrels and it made her really very rich. Physicist and solar power pioneer, Dr. Maria Telkes teamed up with an equally excellent lady, the architect Eleanor Raymond. They built the first home entirely heated by solar power in 1947. In 1899, Letta Tita Jir invented a medical syringe that could be operated with only one hand. Florence Papart invented the modern electric refrigerator in 1914. In 1900, Papart received a patent for a vastly improved street cleaning machine, which she marketed and sold to cities across America because she was incredible. The ice cream maker Nancy Johnson invented the ice cream freezer in 1843, patenting a design which is still used to the current day, even after the advent of electric ice cream makers. Computer algorithm Ada Lovelace, whose father was Lord Byron, was encouraged by her scientist mother from a young age to become a champion of mathematics. Telecommunications technology, the theoretical physicist Dr. Shirley Jackson, was the first black woman to receive a PhD from MIT in 1973 while working at Bell Laboratories. She conducted breakthrough basic scientific research that enabled others to invent the portable fax, touchstone telephone, solar cells, fiber optic cables, and the technology behind call ID and call waiting. The dishwasher saving on toll marriages over the last century and a half. The dishwasher was invented by Josephine Cochrane in 1887. Wireless transmission technology, Hedy Lamar's invention of a secret communication system during World War II for radio control and torpedoes, employing frequency hoping technology, laid the technological foundations for everything from Wi-Fi to GPS, she also happened to be a world-famous film star. Closed circuit television, CCTV, Marie Van Britten, Bronx System for Closed Circuit Television Security, patented in 1969, was intended to help people ensure their own security as police were slow to respond to calls for help in her New York City neighborhood. Her invention forms the basis for modern CCTV systems used for home security and police work today. The paper bag machine, Margaret Knight received her patent for a machine that could produce square bottom bags in 1871 after a long legal battle with a fellow mechanist, Charles Annan, who tried to steal her work by arguing that such a brilliant invention could not possibly have been invented by a girl. Also, when Knight was 12 years old, she invented a safety device for cotton mills, which is still used today, central heating. Alice Parker, who invented a system of gas-powered central heating in 1919, while her particular design was never built. It was the first time an inventor had conceived of using natural gas to heat a personal home and inspired the central heating systems of the future Kevlar. The chemist Stephanie Kowalex 
invented the super strong Kevlar fiber used to make bulletproof vests. Kuvdes invention is five times stronger than steel and also has about 200 other uses. Computer software Dr. Grace Murray Hooper, a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy, was also a computer scientist who invented COBOL, the first user-friendly business computer software program. Throughout the 1960s, she led efforts to develop compliers for COBOL. Her biographer, Kurt Beer, calls her the person most responsible for the success of COBOL during the 1960s. Her influence was significant. By the 1970s, COBOL was the most extensively used computer language in the world. She was also the first person to use the term bug to describe a glitch in a computer system after finding an actual moth causing trouble in her computer. Inventor of drugs, Gertrude Bell Elion, January 23, 1918, February 21, 1999, was an American biochemist and pharmacologist. But some women worked in professions and jobs available mostly to men. There were women doctors, lawyers, preachers, teachers, writers, and singers. By the early 19th century, however, acceptable occupations for working women were limited to factory labor or domestic work. Women are the primary caretakers of children and elders in every country of the world. International studies demonstrate that when the economy and political organization of a society change, women take the lead in helping the family adjust to new realities and challenges. What is remarkable within the ambience of women in culture in the beginning of the 20th century, women were regarded as society's guardians of morality. They were seen as possessing a finer nature than men and were expected to act as such. Their role was not defined as workers or money makers. Women were expected to hold on to their innocence until the right man came along so that they can start a family and inculcate the morality they were in charge of preserving. The role of men was to support the family financially. Yet, at the turn of the 20th century, social attitudes towards educating young women were changing. Women in North America and Western Europe were now becoming more and more educated, in no small part because of the efforts of pioneering women to further their own education, defying opposition by male educators. By 1900, four out of five colleges accepted women and a whole co-ed concept was becoming more and more accepted. At this juncture, it must be noted that it is because of a woman, my late mother, Ira Louise Mears Gittens, parenting as a mother, that I was able, through my cognitive lens, contextualize and analyze the aforesaid data in the context of culture. In this space, I have discovered that during the process of formulating and assembling theoretical components of women in culture, it is categorized as a theoretical construct but revolves around both the topic and the environment culture. This culture is seemingly learned and practiced by all global citizens through the annals of history and research lens, it appears that throughout history, generation after generation, regardless of their decline and regrowth, all cultures change through time. It seems that although on one hand, all cultures would have changed through time, on the other hand, culture is not static. Perhaps the dynamics of culture are the invisible nuance which corroborates why women have always played a critical role throughout history from generation after generation. Rav Linton's argument that culture 
is perceived as the way of its members, the collection of ideas and habits which they learn are shared and transmitted from generation to another generation may be why the women in culture were also profiled by identities, namely class, culture, ethnicity, gender, hierarchy, ownership, and race, which are characteristics that function as points of identification according to Stuart Hall. Women in Culture was examined through the humanity of culture lens, since this lens highlights women in culture as global citizens who exhibited conscience, emotions, heart, mind, soul, and spirit operating within every cultural geographical space. Finally, this intellectual conversation, women in culture, seemingly orbits around activities and events related to women in culture and its environment was composed in nine chapters and framed in ISBN 9781-63877-2989.